Good day, everyone. The Society of Actuaries is pleased to present this webcast, Predictive Analytics and Actuaries, Insights to Solve Healthcare Challenges and Identify Opportunities. My name is Eric, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Please note that today's call is being recorded, and all participant lines will be muted during this broadcast. If you are listening to the program over the phone and you need assistance at any time today, please press star zero, and an operator will assist you. Today's presentation will last up to 60 minutes and include a specific question and answer period. However, you can enter a question for us at any time during today's presentation. You may submit a question by typing it into the box in the lower right corner of the window, then be sure to click on the send button located next to the box. If you are listening to the audio only and do not have access to the chat box, you may submit your questions to soa at compartners.com. These instructions will be repeated later in the program. We would like to remind you that the SOA does adhere to a strict antitrust policy. For more information on the SOA's antitrust policy, please visit the SOA website. And one final disclaimer, presentations are intended for educational purposes only and do not replace independent professional judgment. Please refer to the SOA's presentation disclaimer. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Joan Barrett, who will introduce today's speakers. Please go ahead, Joan. Thank you, Eric, and welcome, everyone. You know, actuaries have always done predictive analytics. We do predictive analytics every time we set a premium rate or estimate a reserve. But so much has happened in the last few years. Computers are faster than ever, they're more powerful than ever, and they're cheaper than ever. We now have a wide array of online resources, everything from freeware to courseware. And we also have new sources of data. This is going to create a new world of opportunities, not only for actuaries, but for the healthcare industry in general. Today we have three industry leaders who will help walk us through that and what it might mean to you. So with that, I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves. Sarah, you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to. Hello, my name is Sarah Osborne, and I'm the Chief Actuary and Analytics Officer at Government Employees Health Association. Um, GEHA is the second largest national health plan and dental plan serving federal employees, uh, retirees, and their families. And so when I joined GEHA a couple years ago, the organization wasn't very robust in the way of analytics, and so we have been working to create and build out an analytics center of excellence. Um, so our use of predictive analytics is still relatively new and still progressing, um, but I'm excited about the momentum that we have. Um, and to me, predictive analytics just means analyzing our data to gain insight and develop uh, predictions of future events. Thank you, Sarah. Michael? I'm Michael Shaw, and I'm currently leading the Enterprise Analytics Organization at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, New Mexico, Montana, Oklahoma, and Texas. And so my area is a newly created area prior to uh, holding this role. Um, I've been in a variety of data science functions since 2014. So currently as a company, we have various groups that are doing predictive analytics already at different uh, levels and stages. And uh, my area is acting as both a center of excellence as well as delivering analytical and data products to business areas that don't have those capabilities. Thank you. And Patrick? Hi, my name is Patrick Jetson. I'm with Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. We're a regional health plan in North Carolina that has about $10 billion in revenue and about 3.7 million members we serve. Um, my background is really coming up through the actuarial chain. I was the chief actuary at Blue Cross North Carolina for about 10 years. Um, but as of February, I took on a new role. I'm the first chief data and analytics officer in the history of the company. Uh, it's a new focus that we have on data and analytics, uh, data management, as well as advanced analytic tooling. Uh, for me, predictive analytics can be, it really is a spectrum. It can be as simple as correlation or what interesting patterns you find between things, or maybe something more sophisticated like causation or why those things have those patterns. And you see things from, you know, when I was growing up, it was things like regression. But we've gotten to a place where we're using vast data sets and advanced analytic tooling like agent-based modeling or causal machine learning. So it's a really exciting time to be in our industry. Thank you. So I'm going to start with the elephant in the room, and that is the cost of health care. Currently in the United States, health care represents 18% of our gross 
domestic product compared to about 11% in other countries like the UK and Germany. So my question to the group is, how can we use predictive analytics to reduce that cost and increase quality? Patrick, why don't you kick us off this time? Sure. Um, you know, what I usually say is that with premiums going up, you know, 8% a year or so and salaries going up 2 to 2.5% 2 a year, you don't have to be an actuary to understand that's an unsustainable cost model. So there's a lot of work that can be done in the healthcare industry to try to bring those costs down. And some things are simple, um, like stratifying providers of care by cost and quality. You can build some really nice products and networks around that type of information. But I think where it's getting interesting in our industry is when you take, let's say, more outcomes, cost, quality, and consumer experience, and you create programs that try to create value across all three. A couple of examples that we've done, um, one thing we've done is we've created a match.com type uh, product offering between patient and provider that allows us to direct somebody uh, to a high quality but efficient provider, but also uses attributes from the member to increase the experience. We're also working uh, with some pretty advanced tooling to uh, really try to understand cost bloom analysis where people are going to be high cost, but the data doesn't actually show that they will be. They're not chronic. And then the most obvious example, I think, and something we're working on hard is how do you actually use better analytics around supporting value-based care or value-based reimbursement to providers where it's not enough just to align the financial incentives between payer and provider, but you've got to give the provider some reporting and insight in order to make sure they're successful in that type of model. Great. Thank you. Michael, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I've actually worked on some initiatives that are very similar to what Patrick mentioned, mainly in the provider space. So how do we actually personalize recommendations for our members so that we direct them to the highest quality, uh, lowest cost uh, provider for them? And as Patrick mentioned, there's also a lot of areas around uh, network design. Um, another area that we're using bridge mailings for is actually for anomaly section. And so we're looking specifically at providers and members. So are there outliers? Are the providers that are, for example, um, gaming uh, their, their charge master or their members that have behaviors that are really expect, uh, outside the expected norm? So those are all things that we can do to reduce premiums for, for our members. Great. And Sarah? Sarah, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't have a, a lot more to add, but I would say that I think there's also, outside of what's already been mentioned, um, opportunities with technology and, you know, in the future, there, you know, I think we can better leverage those things like wearables or monitoring patients um, in their um, care situations, you know, for example, someone that's in the hospital predicting someone that may be likely to have a heart attack on there, things like that. So deploying um, technology and predictive analytics to help us uh, better treat, um, treat our members. Great. So for the next question, it's very similar. How are we using predictive analytics to do our basic actuarial functions better? Pricing, reserving, et cetera. Sarah, why don't you kick us off this time? So, so I think, as you mentioned earlier, Joan, I mean, actuaries have been doing predictive analytics for a long time. We use predictive analytics in, in pricing our products. Um, and there's definitely that opportunity to, I think, use more of that. Um, one example that we currently have in development is a supplemental IBNR model using predictive analytics, and um, it's kind of a joint project that uh, some of our actuarial staff and uh, data scientists have been involved in, um, so that's kind of exciting. Great. Michael, do you have any thoughts? So I've actually worked on a, um, a fairly large reserving initiative in the past at a previous employer where we tried to use machine learning instead of traditional um, actuarial methods to uh, predict uh, the amount of reserves that we should hold. Um, there's also uh, things that Patrick has mentioned in the past, identifying high-cost high claimants, which has always been um, a, a challenge regardless of what method you use. Um, so we've also explored uh, incorporating consumer data into the underwriting process, although the initial results don't actually indicate that the lift is, is uh, that high compared to just using medical costs alone. Great. And Patrick? Yeah, again, um, like Sarah was saying, not a lot to add on this from the prior uh, answers, but uh, Michael mentioned underwriting. We're actually doing a little bit more on the underwriting side with different types of data um, to feeding into our underwriting systems. Um, we're starting to put a lot of third-party information into to those algorithms, as well as starting to experiment a little bit with social determinant data as well. 
Um, so I think there's uh, an ability to be more accurate in how you're setting those claims. Um, with the pricing and the reserving, it's obviously much better to be accurate there. And the obvious benefit is that you get better financial planning and forecasting out of it. Great, thank you. And I think you've already started to answer my next question, and that is, um, how does your company use predictive analytics for other functions like um, human resources, strategic planning? Patrick, do you want to continue on? Sure. Um, what, I'll, what I'll say kind of at a high level is that we use predictive analytics across the board in our company. And that goes from, you know, traditional ways to do it around our finance functions. But we're really starting to use it in places like strategy and even HR. And the example I wanted to use in HR, which is to me very, very cool, is we're starting to use some virtual reality uh, technology that allows um, you know, prospective employees to come into a virtual environment. And not only is it a fun experience for prospective employees, but it allows us to actually record where they're spending their time and to show where your value as an employer is more likely to be with certain demographics um, out there. So even for something like recruiting, uh, predictive analytics is making its way in there. Great. Sarah? Yeah, we've also started using some predictive analytics um, in other areas of our business, our marketing team, um, some different groups that we're partnering with. But um, again, since we're still in development, I feel like we're starting to just scratch the surface with what we can do. Um, we recently did a series of analytics roadshows internally with all of the different business units of the company, and it's been really great to see the interest and the ideas that are being generated in terms of how we could potentially deploy our analytic resources with other business functions. And, and HR was actually one that was very excited and, um, you know, it comes down to us having the resources to, to be able to help all those units, but I think there's a lot of potential there. Great, great. Um, and finally, Michael, your thoughts? Yes, I think Sarah and Patrick had both mentioned HR, which is actually a personal interest of mine. Uh, so when you're growing out and building out an organization, you have to hire a lot of people very quickly, and you want to make sure that you maintain that level of talent. So one of the problems that we've had is just in terms of operations, uh, the recruiters actually have to reach out and contact all the candidates to do a phone screen. So let's say you get 100 resumes for a position. How do you actually use text analytics to go through those resumes and say, these are the positions or these are the applicants that are most like the high-quality candidates that already have or uh, that already fill those roles and maybe prioritize for the recruiter instead of having a first-in, first-out system? Um, there are other areas, especially in operations, which are, are ripe for predictive analytics, especially around, for example, customer service calls. How do you identify that a customer may not be happy with uh, the service that they received and they may need a follow-up? Or if you have a particular type of customer or request, how do you actually redirect that towards the appropriate channels? Um, you've got standard operational uh, claims issues as well, such as payment integrity, uh, claims adjustments, and things like uh, prompt pay in certain states where we have penalties if we don't pay a claim on time. Cool. Thank you. So let's go outside our comfort zone a bit and talk about how predictive analytics can be used to improve uh, direct patient care. Uh, Sarah, do you want to start us off on that one? The mute button, Sarah. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, 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 uh, for providers here by providing um, and using predictive analytics to identify events before they happen so they can focus on a particular population to help increase program efficiency or identifying gaps in care. Um, you know, I've seen other programs where you can apply this to the op opioid crisis and using predictive analytics to identify uh, patients that could be most at risk for issues there. So um, um, those are some ideas that I had. Great. Michael? I think it's um, always actually challenging to try to directly influence uh, the, the behavior of physicians. And so that's something from the insured side that we've actually provided data to, to the um, providers to help them understand where they compare relative to their peers. Um, I think another way to actually improve direct patient care is something that Patrick has already mentioned. How do we simply just steer a member towards providers that are already doing the things uh, the right way? And that may actually be easier than trying to influence them directly. But on the provider side, you know, they're um, – they, they are definitely using a lot of the electronic health record data to start getting insights uh, for themselves. And obviously for them, um, which is 
uh, revenue optimization, you know, how do they actually, um, you know, contract with insurers to increase the revenue? And of course, we're kind of, that's an adversarial relationship. We don't want them to do that. We want to kind of, you know, low, uh, minimize the amount of revenue that they're generating. Great. And Patrick. Yeah, this, this is actually a, a piece I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. And Michael raises a good point where we talk about the traditional relationship between payer and provider and how we used to sit across the table and um, argue and negotiate rates. I think as we move more aggressively towards value-based care, this is really the area where you can provide information insight reporting to providers to help them be successful in these types of models. We're already moving where, from the payer side of pushing towards different sites of care. You know, we went from facility to uh, moving them into urgent care, into physician's offices. Um, I think that the types of data that are going to be available for care is really gonna be different in the next five years. You're going to have more telemedicine uh, or virtual visits. You're going to have, as Sarah mentioned earlier, you're going to have wearable information that's coming in. And the challenge for the industry is going to be, how do you take all these disparate sources of information, aggregate them effectively, and then create the tooling and insight reporting to create uh, action plans that providers can actually uh, put into their workflow to try to bring down total cost of care. Great. Thank you. So the next question is um, about the organizations we all work for. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people weren't talking about telemedicine much or uh, some of the stuff that we're talking about. How has your organization made the cultural shift from a more traditional organization to a more modern one? And let's start with um, Sarah on that one. So, as I mentioned earlier, the cultural shift at GHA is still in progress. Um, you know, we're, we're moving away from aging infrastructure, investing in new tools and technology. Um, we've been moving away from fragmented data architecture to something more scalable, uh, moving away from just providing reports to really delivering insights and, and valuable analysis from our data. Um, and getting the budget and resources we needed to do this didn't come overnight, um, but I think it helped to have use cases to really showcase the value of the analytics team. That's really helped us um, move things along and continue to progress and get more resources. Um, but we've also been met with resistance through the process, too. Um, I think a good example is as we move to having our business define more how we consume our data and prioritize projects versus IT doing that, we were met with some resistance. Um, we've also been working to break down silos that exist with some of our business units. Um, and I think that, again, as time passes and the areas begin to see that our analytics team is a trusted partner in a non-threatening way, the adoption of analytics um, will progress. And um, once the insights are delivered, you start to generate more and more buy-in and support, and, and that culture changes. Yeah, I can take this one, John. Um, so my uh, company is actually facing a lot of similar ch challenges to, to Sarah's. And I think the main goal is um, in the past, you know, insurers have mainly been operational in nature. And so how do we actually treat data as a strategic asset? Because it really is what differentiates us because we're already the hub of receiving a lot of this data. So if you kind of look at the amount of data that we have, um, almost no other entity other than maybe the government has that amount of data. So how do you actually turn people from having this operational view to this more strategic view? Um, so things like infrastructure and, and other things are, are challenges that we face as well. Um, one thing to help with kind of getting buy-in from your business stakeholders is really just talking about the business value. I don't think folks necessarily care about the latest algorithms and, you know, the coolest predictive modeling techniques, although, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I love talking about that stuff. Personally, it's about how you can use those things to show that, okay, you're going to actually be able to make better decisions and do it faster and easier using these techniques compared to what you have today. Joan, um, it's Patrick. Do you want me to follow up third on this? Okay, happy to do so. Um, so I'm going to maybe talk a little bit where Sarah was going from a culture perspective. Um, I think it's critically important to get a buy-in from senior leadership to be able to um, actually create a cultural shift or a pivot for your company. Um, we have a new CEO in our company, Dr. Patrick Conway, who was at CMS before. That we're very fortunate that he understands the ability uh, or the value that actually comes from strong data and analytics. 
Um, so we've done a few things here. So we, first thing we did was we created a data and analytic division that reports directly to the CEO. Um, many companies, it's not shown at that level. Uh, the second thing we did was we created a strategic pillar, uh, how we're going to execute against our strategy as a company. Uh, we have one around data. And then the third thing that we did was we created a cultural value around data and analytics. So how our employees come to work every day, and that goes from officers all the way down to line level employees. Uh, we have a value that's around data and using data in your everyday decision making. We want data and analytics to really be part of the DNA of the company, regardless of level of employee. The one thing that I was uh, want to make sure I mentioned, though, however, is if you're making the shift as a company, you um, you can't just uh, think through uh, what is it going to look like a year or two from now. You actually have to deliver value to the company and keep momentum going as you're doing your pivot or your shift. And that's been critically important for us as well. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? I had some problems. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. My apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, there are new data sources um, that are available to us now, so let's explore that a bit. Michael, you want to kick that off? Yeah, so uh, this has been mentioned before, but one of the interesting uh, data sets that exists out there is consumer data. It's actually surprising how much um, some of these companies actually know about us and aggregate about us. Um, and so they include things like, you know, socioeconomic status, estimated income, you know, even what magazines you subscribe to. Um, so we're also starting to use a lot of geographic data, so especially in the provider space. How do you actually start looking at things like distances, understanding how people actually interact with, with their doctors? Um, so we're also in the process of ingesting um, kind of unstructured electronic health records. So things like nurses notes and doctors notes where you'll need a lot of natural language processing to actually extract value from that. Simply um, doing descriptive analytics uh, actually will, will not really tell you anything. Um, my a personal interest of mine is uh, computer vision. So there's a lot of publicly available data sets out there with uh, MRIs, um, x-rays, CT scans, um, especially with things like cancer. So I actually think that's actually one area where an insurer may potentially be able to make a play. So that's something that I'm exploring currently in my company. Great, thank you. Patrick? Yeah, so I'll add on to what Michael was saying. There's third party information that we along uh, many, many other companies purchase. We're, we're starting to get into social determinant data. I just wanna give you one quick example. Uh, I was working with a company uh, a few weeks ago and you know we talked about actuarial risk or health status risk. And what I said was I was really interested in looking at correlations uh, between health status and uh, food and housing insecurity. And that gets really interesting because now you're talking about policy changes and addressing some of these problems on the front end rather than just dealing with the actuarial risk on the back end. We're also experimenting with things like Michael is talking about geospacing data to make sure that we're sending our members to the right places. And we're moving towards uh, things like trying to use air quality weather information in some of our analysis as well. So a lot of different types of information. That's really cool, thank you. All right, so the math behind predictive analytics can be complicated, esoteric at the least, to say the very least. So what are some of the communications challenges you have faced and how did you overcome them? Let's start with Michael. Yeah, so the math is uh, definitely interesting to us actuaries, but for most of our business customers, it's um, not that interesting. And as soon as you start talking about this stuff, you know, a lot of their eyes tend to glaze over. So for me, if I build a new model, my team builds a new gradient boosting model, and we improve accuracy by 1%, that's awesome. But um, your business customers may not actually care. So I actually had a professor um, say that regardless of how smart people are, as soon as you start putting formulas um, in your presentations, people, you know, tend to tune out. Um, so one way to actually overcome that is actually through visualizations, which is, I think, an area that's not talked about that much. How do you actually turn your, your data or your results into really easy to understand graphs, charts, or even maps for, for some of these? And I, I find that people are um, really, really interested in that, especially senior leadership. So we've created, um, for example, some social network analysis that we did for providers and uh, patient relationships. And every time um, our senior leadership is like, hey, can you give us an updated version of this so we can uh, put this in our slides. Great, thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I'll just kind of pay, piggyback on those thoughts. You know, when I think about the challenges that our team has faced, communication actually um, hasn't been a major issue. 
Uh, we structured our, our center of excellence such that the actuaries and analysts that are part of what we call our delivery sub-team are people that have really solid communication and customer service skills. Um, and as we've been building out the team, we've been very purposeful in selecting individuals with these skills, and I think that's really helped. Um, and I'd also say that most of our customers trust the work that's being done, and they're really, you know, I, I'd agree with Michael, they're not looking to get into the weeds or the math or really detailed explanations. They just want the answers and the insights that they need. Great. And Patrick, anything sure. you want to add? Yeah, thank you, Joan. Um, just I'll add on to what's already been said, but I think that what's really important here is that your analysts in the company actually understand pretty crisply the business model of your company. Uh, but I also think it's important for your business partners to actually understand a little bit of the analytic tooling that's available to help solve their problems. And you kind of need to come together a little bit. I used to say about 10 years ago at, at, at my company that leaders in the company needed to have a financial acumen. And now I'm moving towards our leaders in our company still also need to have an analytics acumen because of what's available. So communication, is, I think, is really critically important in bringing those together. And one of the things that we've done is we've been very purposeful, Sarah. I like the, the fact that you use that word. We've been very purposeful in creating a communication playbook um, that is not only educating my board of trustees on what, what's available in analytics. So if you said something like artificial intelligence, you might get five different definitions of what that actually is. Um, but so we're trying to speak the same language in our company, but it goes from board of trustees down to senior leaders, all the way down to line employees. And, and we create a very purposeful playbook about how we're communicating those things. Um, out of all the things that we do, I think the things that kind of make or break you sometimes as a company is from a culture perspective is, you know, the communication and change management around this. So that's something you really have to keep your eye on. Great. Thank you. So Sarah, what value do you as an actuary bring to the table regarding predictive analytics? Um, you know, I think analytics has always been a part of our actuarial domain, but obviously there's much more focus specifically on the predictive analytics field um, in recent years. And I think that actuaries are really well positioned to lead in this area. Uh, we're trained not only to apply analytical techniques, but also to practically implement them and effectively communicate the results. Um, our profession is also trained to adhere to our published standards of practice, and we're held accountable to those standards and our code of professional conduct. So um, I think those are all things that bring value um, to us as actuaries and, and our profession. And we also have the predictive analytics and futurism section within the Society of Actuaries, and I'm a part of that, and I know many other actuaries participate in that as well, and I think it just shows the dedication um, and the focus the actuaries have in this field. Great, thank you. Patrick, your thoughts? Um, what I was going to say is the thing that myself or really any actuary brings to the table with regards to predictive analytics is really marrying business knowledge and an analytic skill set. I, I kind of think of actuaries as translators, and I think these are hard people to find, but people who can bounce back and forth between the business side and the science side. I think these skills are, have always been critical, uh, but I think it gets even more important in the future as more data uh, and more analytic tooling, more advanced tooling becomes available. And you know, one of the things we say is that we really don't do the analytics just because it's fun, even though it's fun. Uh, you do it to solve problems and you do it to solve business problems. And so I think actuaries really can step in and because of that business background, help use these tools to solve important business problems. Great, Michael? Uh, yeah, so I think Sarah and Patrick said it really well, so I have nothing to add. Great. All right. So limitations, what do you see as the limitations of predictive analytics, Michael? Yeah, so predictive analytics, again, is based on historical data. So an obvious example is if there's a change in the state of the world, so let's say ACA. You clearly can't use pre-ACA data to make any sort of reasonable prediction about the post-ACA world. So that's, that's, again, an obvious regulatory example, but there could be others as well. So if there are changes in uh, preferences or behavior or even things that aren't as obvious, um, you always have to be on the constant lookout for that. And so you have to monitor your performance, do it frequently, and make sure that um, if there is a change in, in, your, in the performance of your models, you understand exactly why it's happening. Okay. Um, Michael, you're th I'm sorry, Patrick, you're <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, that, what Michael said is correct. If you don't have data, it's, uh, and I'm going to flip this one around a little bit. I think the limitation is really around, if it's got to be 100% right, I don't know, I don't know the predictive analytics is the tool that you want. Um, but what's great about predictive analytics is it can give you not only if it's 70, 80% right, the ability to make good decisions, but with things like um, very complex systems like agent-based modeling, even in the situation Michael described where the data is not available, um, it allows you to do simulation analysis to at least give you outcomes based off different types of scenarios that happen. Great. And Sarah. Okay. No. Um, actually, uh, let's shift gears here. Um, so I'd like to know a little bit about how you set up your unit, Sarah. I think you've already mentioned that, but Michael, do you want to talk a bit about what you did to get your uh, unit set up and how you made that happen? What kind of people you look for? Oh, okay. So this is about organizational setup. Yeah. yeah. So I actually looked um, to the tech industry when I structure my team. So you kind of look out how um, companies, large tech companies like, you know, Google, Facebook, Apple, and so on, Amazon, structure their teams. They generally have three types of roles uh, for their data science teams. Uh, the first one is the actual data scientist, someone who's skilled at predictive modeling, machine learning, um, and other things. Uh, you also have a data engineer role, and these are more times your IT-ish people who are really good with working with unstructured data, so data that doesn't really fit in this relational database uh, format. And they're also really good at optimizing your pipelines because um, when you're actually deploying these solutions, you don't necessarily want your data scientists to be doing that. You want them to be on the explore, uh, exploration, prototyping, communication side of things. And finding there's a role which I think um, is actually really easy for Ashrays to fit in because Ashrays do bridge the technical and business side, as Patrick mentioned, which is uh, the product manager role. So um, the way that my organization is set up and the way that I've delivered things in the past is really to take this product a focused mindset, which is we're going to deliver analytical and data products because when you start with a product mindset rather than a model mindset, uh, it's about how would I get this product to use. So you think about aspects like um, the user interface and how do you um, implement or operationalize this into existing processes. Um, so those are the three types of roles that we would uh, look to, to build in on my teams. Great. Michael or Sarah, do you have anything you'd like to add? This is Patrick. Um, I can I can jump in here. The, uh, I'm actually in the process of building out a centralized data management and advanced analytics division. So it's a little interesting that I'm taking skill sets that we already have, bringing in some teams from other divisions in, but I'm also doing what Michael's doing, which is hiring some different types of skill sets going forward. One of the things that we did, and it really made me feel good to hear Michael say this because we're doing the same thing, is we've taken some of our kind of very custom job descriptions uh, and we made them more industry standard. So Michael referenced data scientists, data engineers, product managers, uh, uh, development ops people. Th those are the types of jobs that we're pulling together. But from a behavioral standpoint, it's funny. We, we as a company have suffered from really uh, detailed job descriptions or job requirements for these types of jobs. Um, I'm trying to push us more towards kind of the Google uh, method of, I think Google wants problem solvers. That's their job description or job requirement. I'm looking for people who know how to solve problems, but also one word I really like is curiosity. Uh, I want people who are curious about how things work and are interested in solving them. Great. And Sarah, any final thoughts on the building the unit? Um, no, I think I would just piggyback on, on what Patrick and Michael had to say. I think that's exactly what you're looking for and, and as you're building out a team. So, Great. Thank you. All right. So now it's time for some final thoughts from everyone. I'm curious about where you are going next in your predictive analytics journey and any advice you might have for someone who's just starting in that field. So, Patrick, why don't you kick that off? Sure. Um, when I took the job, I wanted to benchmark kind of where we were from a capability perspective on data management and analytic tooling. And what we found out was that in the Blue Cross Blue Shield world, we started above average. When you compare us to for-profit, uh, the overall healthcare sector, including for-profits, we were about average. But the, the really eye-opening piece was that healthcare was pretty far behind other industries like financial services and retail. So I think the hopeful part of this is there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare to leverage data and analytics to create a, a bunch of value. Our aspiration is not to be uh, the best blue plan out there. We actually want to be one of the plans or one of the companies that are top 20% across all sectors. 
But the thing I'd like to maybe leave the group on is that the thing that keeps me up at night when I'm doing this build is not whether I've got smart enough people or the right data or good technology and tooling. It really is around the culture piece, change management, um, and getting the company to think very differently about how to use this as a critical lever to drive value. Great. Uh, Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, so it's definitely a very exciting time to be in this space. So I would say for those of you that aren't already working here, I would just say dive in, um, just go in head first. So one piece of advice is to really have a customer focus. So it ties back to building a data culture. Um, so you have people that are maybe skeptical about what you're doing and exactly because they don't necessarily understand uh, the, the black box, so to speak. So how do you actually show and, and deliver the value in a way that they really understand that and over time build that data culture? So when I speak to the people who are actually um, you know, building these models, that's, that's really what they're encountering resistance from within the organization is that you have people that are mostly um, used to making decisions based on, on, on their guts. And honestly, for some of these blues, they've actually been very, very successful doing that. So for these people, it's, okay, I've been doing very well with what I've done for the past 20, 30 years. Um, why should I listen to you now? So it's really overcoming that, and I think that's my primary focus, you know, over the next um, year or so. Sarah? Uh, and I, I would agree with that. I've experienced this, the same thing um, as Michael. And, you know, I think that you just have to continue to um, showcase those use cases and f find ways to share examples where analytics can move your business from being reactive to proactive versus making um, those decisions um, reactively or using just using your gut instead of using the data. And I think sharing those wins along the way help develop the support and buy-in you need. Great. Thank you. So um, let me finish with a few thoughts of my own. Um, well, first of all, thank you to the panel. You were great. I've, I've learned a lot today. Um, but I want to just reiterate something several of you have mentioned. This is a game changer, um, and we have a we as actuaries have a lot to um, to add to the con to the to the conversation. And it's not just doing data crunching and analysis. It's the translation of that analysis into a business decision that's going to be great. The SOA is very committed to making sure that you have the tools you need. And one of the things that I want to call your attention to is called Initiative 1811, What Can We Do About the Cost of Healthcare? This is a joint venture between the Society of Actuaries and the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, our goals are pretty simple. We want to identify the key cost drivers of healthcare costs. Uh, we want to break down silos between professions, and we want to execute on some very actionable items. You'll be able to find out more about this in the October edition of Health Watch. And as you can see from the links here, this you can find that on the website along with the professional development calendar that will help you with other educational opportunities like this. And if you have any questions, um, you can contact Courtney Nashen, who is on the SOA staff, or you can contact me directly, and we can disseminate that as appropriate. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over for questions. Um, can you talk to me? Um, Eric, did you want to repeat how people do the questions? Absolutely. So as a reminder for everyone, you can enter a question for us at the lower right of your screen. Be sure to type in your question and then click on the send button. Joan will read these questions out loud and then our panelists will respond so that everyone may hear them as well. And if you are listening to the audio only and do not have access to the chat box, you may submit your questions to soa at compartners.com. Joan, please go ahead with any questions we have. Sure. So the first question is um, a little more specific than our discussion so far. 
and it's can we hear about typical tools that are used, general Iceland, near models, random forests, et cetera. Michael, do you want to um, start with that? Yeah, I can definitely take that one. So uh, I actually do machine learning competitions for fun, I know, um, on Kaggle. So I would say if you had to start with a single model, what's proven to work best across a variety of data sets in a traditional a regression type problem is something called a gradient boosting tree. And so I would suggest reading that and uh, learning more about that. So the resource I recommend to anyone who's trying to get started in this area is to read an introduction to statistical learning, um, which is actually, I believe, one of the two textbooks now on the new uh, SRM exam. Um, so it is absolutely fantastic. If you go through that whole thing, you'll, be, you'll have a solid foundational understanding of most of the um, machine learning uh, tools and, and algorithms that are currently in use. Um, but another thing that people tend to do nowadays, and which actually um, isn't used in the real world, but is more applicable for competitions, is um, ensembling models or stacking models, which is taking a variety of models and applying kind of a wisdom of crowds approach, where, okay, so maybe a GLM performs better on a certain subsegment of your data, uh, but a gradient boosting tree performs better on other subsegments. So if you kind of combine those two, uh, you should theoretically be able to get a better model. Um, but for reasons of interpretability, a lot of folks don't actually take those models and actually implement them, even though they may outperform a single model. The single model is still a lot more interpretable and easy to explain. Okay, great. So I think you, um, uh, you jumped to the hard one. Uh, Sarah, what happens if you're just getting started and you know, basically have no knowledge and you just want to build your knowledge? A lot of us, especially some of the older actuaries, found ourselves in that position. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it, it can be really overwhelming um, and you, you know, you can feel like you're behind and, um, you know, when I was in college, I wasn't taking predictive analytics courses. I wasn't, you know, everything I've had to do, it's been learning on the job and um, you know, hire, hiring people that are smarter than I am to help and, and develop the team that we have. Yeah, I, um, I actually took a lot of courses in college, which was many, many years ago. And the emphasis when I took them was all in the theoretical part. I could prove the theorem but not put it to, to good use. And a few years ago, one of the things I did was I just bought for 20 bucks Barron's business statistics and went back and reviewed everything. And that to me was very helpful. I also asked a lot of questions and went to a lot of um, court presentations. I actually did something because that worked for me. Um, well, I think the good thing is, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot more material out there and ways to educate yourself, so you don't have to, you didn't have to have that coursework in college, or if it was so long ago you don't remember, um, there's lots of educational materials out there, courses, um, seminars, and things like that, so you can educate yourself and, and stay on track there. Great. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, and the SOA does, they have webinars, um, there's Coursera if you've never used those in terms of, of learning how to do um, some of these things. So um, here's a question we got in. Predictive modeling is critical in value-based contracts. What's your opinion about the future relationship between payer and provider? Patrick, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I think that predictive analytics is actually critical to uh, uh, really giving tools to providers so that they can succeed. The whole idea of moving to value-based contracting is uh, for the providers to become more efficient but keep the same quality or higher quality in care, um, uh, but do it maybe you know at a lower cost so that um, it's not the same fee-for-service reimbursement that we're in today. And I do think that when we were in the 90s and we tried to move in this direction, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the difference between today and pushing risk onto providers in the 90s? And the, the answer I think is very clear, which is the data sets that we have are so much better and the analytic tooling is so much better. I think that uh, the very first step of getting that information to providers uh, and predictive analytics related to that is incredibly important. The next important step is how to get it into provider workflow so that they can actually execute against it. Great. Michael or Sarah, any comments? I think that was a good answer. 
Yeah, I did too. <laughs> I was taking notes. All right. Um, so the next question has to do with um, dealing with others in your company that have similar skill sets. Um, one of our participants used the term shadow analyst. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk to about that one for us real quick? Uh, sure. Um, that, I'm very familiar with that. We, you know, um, have experienced that in our, our organization quite a bit. And um, so what we've really done, I mentioned earlier we did an analytics roadshow kind of to showcase our analytics center of excellence and um, what we are doing for the organization, what our purpose and our, um, what our goals are. We also shared what's in and out of scope and what we're doing, and I think that's helped the business start to see um, when does it make sense for um, someone on a team um, separately versus our centralized analytics team to work on something. Um, we also developed a systematic analytic process with a charter that we're sharing, and um, that really defines our roles and what are our processes, our purpose, the accountabilities to the different business units in the organization. And so we really try to centralize analytics, but there's still a couple pockets of, of, of areas where we continue to have some sh shadow analysts. And so I found that just partnering with them and understanding what they're delivering versus what we are delivering. And um, there's even been a couple instances where we've actually rolled those, those individuals into our organization where it makes sense. So I think you just kind of have to handle those um, individually because every situation is a little bit different, but I don't think it's a unique problem to have. Hey, Jen, right. this is Patrick. Can I add on to that? Sure. Yeah, so um, this is a struggle for sure, um, and I knew it would be a struggle. I'm just going to give you a quick example. When we announced that we were going to create the centralized data and analytic organization, I had some of my peers that said, hey, that's great. We're really looking forward to supporting you. I had other peers that said, hey, I think it's fantastic that we're moving in this direction. Don't take any of my analysts. And so there's this kind of change and culture piece to it that you've got to manage. But one thing that I did that really was helpful on the front end was I created a definition for what would belong in our division. And it was things like if you're using core uh, platform information like membership and claims, if you uh, would have an advantage of being in a centralized unit so that you would actually learn from other analysts in the company, we created this definition. And then I went to uh, my peers, my, the senior leaders in the company, and I said, this is how I'm approaching this. And I got their buy-in. So it kind of you know, headed off at the pass, some of these people that said we're different because we created a definition on the front end and said this is how we'll make the decisions of whether you come in or not. Yeah. Michael, anything to um, add to that? Yeah, so I'm definitely kind of in the middle of all this. So when I uh, actually took over this new role and the organization was uh, newly created, um, so we had these decentralized teams that were doing advanced analytics, and we also basically had every single division of the company that had folks that were doing uh, re either reporting or analytics. So I think uh, one of my counterparts did analysis, and we had over a thousand employees of the company that had some sort of reporting or analytics title. And uh, so some people wouldn't actually consider reporting analytics, and you know that's debatable. But if you kind of boil it down to folks that were actually doing analytics. Um, what people, most people consider building analytics, maybe it's still a couple hundred folks. So when we create this organization, what we said is we're going to kind of leave that um, as it is because those are um, capabilities that folks have already had for many, many years, the more type of descriptive traditional analytics. And what my area would be mostly focused on is advanced analytics. But even so, I didn't actually have uh, executive buy-in to centralize advanced analytics under my area. So the center of excellence really is more informal. So I know most of these folks. So you have to build the relationships with those folks. And if you have the credibility because you've been doing this for longer um, than they have, um, you can still informally guide them in terms of here's a framework for evaluating an advanced analytics project. Here's a framework for how you deliver this project. Here's a framework for evaluating the ROI of those in initiatives. And so I've had a lot of success doing that. Um, so the question is, are we potentially moving to a centralized um, structure? I think, as Patrick mentioned, there's a lot of politics behind it. So I'm going to kind of punt on that one. <laughs> there's always politics involved. Um, so the next question is along these same lines. Um, one of the participants mentioned that they joined an analytics division, and it ended up being a dumping ground for unfunded IT work. 
polling, simple reports, et cetera. Um, and I think the question is, well, how can you change that? I'm actually going to um, lead on that one because I found myself in a similar situation many years ago. And the way I personally handled it was to always add value. I never just said, here's your data. I would say I would do some observations, maybe talk about the limitations of the data, but always add value no matter how simple the task. And that accumulated over time. Um, in my case, it accumulated where I couldn't keep up with demand, but I do think there are ways to do that. Does anyone want to um, add to that? I, I can jump in, Joan. Um, I think that uh, that's that I've seen that situation happen an awful lot over my career. But I think that the uh, the key for us was really getting that leadership buy in that we were going to do it differently and then calling out behavior when we saw it um, and saying that's really not where we want to go as a company. And it may take two or three conversations. Um, you know, one of the things that I told one of my peers was if you're comparing where we are today uh, versus this new model that we're going to, it's the wrong comparison because where we are today is not where we're going to be tomorrow. It's either that we're going to, you're going to bring in some of that analytic horsepower into my division or we're going to outsource analytics as a company because it's not working as effectively today as we'd like to. So just having some pretty honest conversations with your peers and having your senior leaders backing you on that is really, really important. Great. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I can briefly comment on this. So we've recently had um, a reorganization. So uh, there's a new data organization that probably is kind of similar to what Patrick's leading. And one of the things that we identified, um, and it's always been an issue here, is we have really fragmented data, mostly because we operate in different plans and sometimes they have different ways of doing things. So each area would basically take their own business rules and then want to apply them on top of data. And then what ended up happening was you now had 10 sources of truth. So one of the goals of this new uh, data organization is to actually centralize all of that within a single source of truth within a data lake and then say, okay, work with the business areas to understand what business rules are consistent across those organizations. Let's apply them up front and so we can have something that's as consistent as possible in a single location. And then really if you have something that's only um, applicable to your business area, maybe that's okay for you to do, but to the extent possible, let's try to centralize that. Great. Sarah, anything? Um, yeah, I would just say that, you know, when I came to my company, that was what I was experiencing as well. That was the current state of our, uh, what we called at the time, the data analysis team. And it really was people just pulling extracts and providing reports and just churning that out as fast as they could. And that's all they were able to do. And it really took um, a shift in the company's uh, focus on analytics and getting that buy-in at the executive level of the company and with our board of directors and getting the, um, the buy-in, the resources that we needed to develop uh, the, the tools and the teams that we needed to be effective and not just getting bombarded with that kind of um, data work and reporting. And we really rebranded ourselves internally. We, we changed the name of the team. We wanted everyone to understand that, you know, this is our purpose now and um, to show that functionality to, to the organization. Okay, great. So I just want to remind everyone that um, to send your questions in. We have a couple more questions, but um, I will if you haven't entered your question, please go ahead and do so, and we'll try to get it in. Um, so there are a lot of questions that I'm going to summarize into one, and it's basically about specific techniques. People are asking questions about um, data reduction methods, cluster analysis, et cetera, um, and um, programming languages. Can you just provide a very specific um, overview of, let's start with what are the specific languages and then what are the top techniques you use other than regression analysis. Michael, you want to start us off? Yes, yeah, so I can answer the languages first. So the two most commonly used languages for data science advanced analytics are R and Python. They're both open source. Um, I know the um, the traditional, uh, sorry, the, the, the new exams use R and actually there's a computer-based test for R. Um, 
I would say that I personally prefer Python, and my teams have traditionally actually operated um, almost exclusively in Python. And the reason for that is they're, they're actually very similar. So if you learn R, you can probably pick up Python, so I wouldn't uh, worry about that too much. Uh, but most of the tech companies primarily use Python, so if you look at the open source packages that are being developed currently, uh, generally it comes out a little earlier for Python, so we get access to that a little earlier. And it's more of a programming language, so if you have any sort of programming background at all, it's a little more consistent. R is more of a statistical language, and some of the um, syntax drives you nuts because some packages might have uppercase for some um, you know, functions and some might not. I've literally spent 30 minutes looking at, okay, why is my line code not working, and that ended up being the case. Um, so I personally prefer Python. Um, as far as other tools, um, depending on the size of your data, um, you may or may not want to use dimension reductionality uh, like principal component analysis or cluster analysis. It really depends how big are your computers that you have. If you have really big computers or you have a very large cluster or infrastructure or using cloud where you can actually um, scale up um, and have elastic compute, then maybe you don't start off taking your thousand variables and reducing it. Um, but if it's taking, you know, two days to run your model, then it becomes a practical issue, right? So how do I then take my thousand variables and start doing things like that and turning into 100 or 200 of the most important variables so I can actually, let's say, run my model in a single eight-hour period so I can react to that. So a lot of the questions around do you use dimension reductionality are not about model performance. They're really about practical issues such as runtime. Great. Patrick, Sarah? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add, um, Michael, and we're right where you are. I think R and Python are probably the ones that are utilized most, but I do find it interesting that um, there is a demographic in younger that prefers R and Python, and there's a demographic in older that still relies on SAS coding, um, and we're, we're trying to move away a little bit from the SAS and moving more towards R and Python. I think from an analytic standpoint, that's where we're, we are. Michael mentioned something earlier, which I think is just as important which is there's analytics and then there's the presentation of that analytics and visualization I think is, is crazy important as part of the presentation. And you're seeing a lot of people uh, using Tableau uh, and software like that to do the presentation layer better. Yeah, that's, I've, I've looked into Tableau. That's, that's really interesting. Um, Sarah? Um, Okay, I think we've lost. Um, so um, one last question. Uh, do you do any predictive modeling on claims data? Um, Patrick, you want to start there? Yeah, this is, this is actually a really interesting area. Um, we've gotten to a point, just like many in the industry, where you've got enough data to actually predict diagnosis. Um, so I can tell you, Joan, you know, with, with the right amount of data behind you, what's the likelihood that you're a diabetic, e even if I don't have that claim information? Now, that's pretty cool stuff, but I think where it gets fun is now we're starting to work with companies that are building playbooks around, let's say that there's a chance you're going to have um, a cardiac event in the next year. What, what action plans can you put in for you to take that would actually either mitigate or eliminate that event from happening. I think that's the next stop, step that we're at. So there's a lot of different places to use predictive analytics on claims, but I think uh, diagnosis prediction is particularly interesting. Great. Michael? Yeah, there's just so many different applications for claims just because it's kind of the heart of insurance data. So uh, I kind of mentioned operational data. There's like the clinical uses that uh, Patrick just mentioned. Um, you know, you can tie it to specific providers as well to do analysis there. It's just, it's, honestly, it's endless. Okay. And Sarah? Yeah, I think um, I don't really have anything to add. I think that was a great answer to that question. Great. Thank you, everyone. Well, I think we are about out of time. Eric, any uh, final instructions? Yes, thank you. With that, we will now conclude today's webcast. If you do take a look at the resources tab on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a link to the webcast evaluation. Please take a moment now to complete the evaluation and give us your feedback on the program. Click on Submit when you have completed the evaluation to send us your responses. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us, and they help us to provide you with this kind of quality programming. To register for any of our upcoming webcasts or meetings, or to purchase recordings of previous webcasts, please visit www.soa.org today. Thank you for your participation in today's webcast. We hope to see you here again soon. Today's program is copyright 2018 by the Society of Actuaries with All Rights Reserved. This concludes today's program. Thank you. You may now disconnect.